everyone. Welcome back. I'm Sonika Garcia. And I'm Brad Davidson. And I'm Gabriel Allen Cummings. And this is Breaking the Code. A podcast that takes the BS out of behavioral science for marketers and non-marketers alike. We hope to arm you, our listeners, with the tools you need to make sense of behavioral science and to help you apply it to your work as communication extraordinaires. So welcome back. As I mentioned, um, this is our 25th episode and it's also our anniversary episode. Our first episode came out exactly a year ago, which is crazy. And today we're going to be talking about generations and what's real about them and what's pretty much BS about them. So obviously we're in a different format today. We are recording this episode. We have Gabriel with us, who is part of our medical anthropology team, and he is going to step out from behind the scenes and take a seat at the mic. So we're really excited to have him. We're talking about generations. So Gabe is Gen Z, Brad, who you all know and love. He's Gen X, and I'm a millennial. And yeah, we're just trying to do something different. We're filming ourselves. trying to step it up, take this podcast to the next level. So let's see how this goes. But thanks for joining. We're really excited to be talking about this. So let's let's jump in. Sure. Brad, what is a generation? Yeah, so the, the reason we decided on this topic was because you're going to hear a lot about generations coming up in the election cycle. That's something that people are always talking about is how did this generation vote? How does this generation vote? And just in general, I think people talk about generations, you know, return to office. How do millennials feel about return to office? There's a lot written about cohorts and there is some reality to it, but there's also some total BS to it, right? And so that's really, we we were thinking of a good topic for our anniversary podcast. We thought this was very timely to arm people a little bit with like your BS sensor should go off sometimes when you hear things about generations that aren't real. And then some of it really is real, right? So just what is a generation? Is a cohort born within the same time band, typically within the same area, right? So baby boomers were born famously after World War II. Everybody came back. There was money everywhere, housing everywhere, and people had a ton of kids. That boom is about 20 years long, which is a little too long for a generation. You can't have a generation where the parents and the kids can be in the same generation. So sometimes people split that. But when they talk about the baby boom, what they're really talking about is like 45 to 64 in the United States. And that was the largest generation ever to that point. Um, It was followed by Gen X, my generation, which is a relatively small generation. I mean, it's still tens of millions of people, but it's not the size of the baby boom. And we were sort of the the latchkey kids, right? Like we're famous now for being the sort of free range children. Everybody frames that up as like this wonderful thing. Lots of stuff happened that no one was aware of. And then the millennials showed up and they were, you know, I was working in advertising and they were called the echo boom initially because it's the children of the baby boomers. Some famously different demographics, much more racially diverse, much more Uh, religiously diverse, many more single parent families, that sort of thing, but same size, right? So you've got a big generation in the boom, then Gen X, then a very large generation of millennials. And then the children, oh, by the way, millennials these days run from, I guess, 1981 to 1996. Uh, For a while, we called them screenagers, right? Because you had never met a bank teller. You'd only interacted with an ATM machine and stuff like that. So like you'd never met a screen you haven't interacted with. It was funny when you were children, you'd walk up to televisions and poke them to try and get them to do something. Um, And then the children of Gen X are Gen Z. And again, so you go big generation, small generation, big generation. Gen Z is a small generation. They're raised by Gen X for the most part. And so there are some realities here in terms of like how large the the cohorts are. The dates are arbitrary, but they tend to track with demographics. And then uh, some trends are real, like, you know, we had different technologies growing up, right? Um, But some of the stuff that people talk about for generations is just fake, right? Um, So we typically hear things like, oh, millennials are the most progressive generation ever. When you're 18 years old, everyone's progressive, right? And so now we're seeing a ton of articles about how conservative millennials are becoming. It's like, not really. They're just moving through the phases of life. You know, Sonika has, if you are on the podcast, you know, Sonika has a small child. That tends to change your perspective on life a little bit when you get married, have a kid, have a mortgage, that sort of stuff. And so, you know, I think some trends are real. 
Some trends are arbitrary and overblown. And I think that's really what we want to discuss. So, and and it's, it is interesting to look at things demographically. I was just listening to someone, I think of Gen X and boomers as being quite different, but it turns out we answer certain cultural questions the same way and millennials and Gen Z answer them the same way. But then if you look at other questions, Gen X and Gen Z really map together, which makes sense because my generation raised your generation and your generation was raised by the boom. So first question is that I have for both of you is we all know what generation we're supposed to be part of. I know I'm Gen X. You know you're a millennial. You know you're Gen Z. Do you feel part of that generation? I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think so. It always it interests me. I know generations are about 15 years. I sometimes 20. I think that that's a big like range and I'm on the younger part of a millennial. So I I think that when I was in my 20s and other millennials were in their 30s, that was kind of a different, like we were in different places. And so I didn't always feel like I was part of my generation. Certain things that I would hear just didn't really resonate. But I think it's because I was in my early 20s and you're kind of changing a lot and, and certain things just, yeah, it just didn't feel like it does. Now, I really feel like I'm part of my generation. I think that being in your 30s and your 40s, you're kind of doing similar things in life. I read and being solidly in a career, having a family, like certain mindsets and values, it feels like it resonates a lot more now. So yeah, I do. But like you were saying, I think that as you move through different phases of life, you feel like you outgrow certain things that people say about your generation. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but yeah, I do. I really do feel like my, and I think I would like was insulted sometimes in my early twenties when I would hear about stereotypes of millennials. And now I'm like, yeah, that is true. And there's nothing wrong with it. And I, I'm proud of it. So yeah, I, I do. Um, Gabe, what about you? So I'd say the insult phase is where I'm at right now, <laughs> where it's like, we're taking all the insults and Gen Z doesn't really control the narrative at all. Yeah. So it's a bit frustrating to say, yes, I belong to this generation. Also just like how I grew up, there are a lot of differences between me and my peers that now that I'm getting older, like you were saying, Sonika, I feel like more closely attached to them. I think it's also like a bit of a, we're a challenger still. Mm -hmm. We're being insulted, but we are embracing our Gen Z-ness. So to answer the question, I feel like there are a lot of ways that I could say like, no, I don't belong to Gen Z. I have these experiences. I feel these things that most people in my peer group don't feel. I want to be Gen Z, so I say I belong. Mm, interesting. interesting. That's in you. So you want to feel like you're. You know, you're part of your generation, and you don't want to feel like you're not. So you're leaning into what people say about Gen Zers. Well, it's more like the conclusions that people make about Gen Z. I feel are grossly inaccurate at times, largely generalized, yeah. and they don't have a lot of context. Yeah. So I want to rectify that a bit. Yeah. You just described cool. how I feel about horoscopes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Complete generalization, you can identify or not. So I, I feel similarly about horoscopes, actually, just an aside. So yeah, I mean, some of it's projected. I feel very much part of Gen X, 100%. But you know, that's more an oppositional sort of attitude on my part. Like, I think Gen X really saw itself as different from the boomers and in conflict with the boomers. I still feel that way. I still, you know, I was raised with the idea that the boomers are going to vacuum up all the resources. And I was told that when I was in college that there won't be social security for you. Like they they knew 50 years ago or 40 years ago that the money was gonna run out. And that really sort of cast a shadow over the generation. I think we felt, and we probably passed it on to you, you're welcome, uh, ignored. You know, there's this famous um, CNN graphic that talks about the generations and they literally cut Gen X out and just went from like boomers to millennials to Gen Z. And like, we shared that around everywhere. Like, I think, we feel like a very ignored generation, a very put upon generation, but we also feel very much like, you know, you, you can't take that away from us, right? So if something comes out like stranger things, we go like, yep, we were left on our own. We absolutely could have summoned a demon and no one would have known, you know, that kind of thing. So I do feel part of my generation. And also, like Sinika said, like you start getting to the the tail end of your career and you start realizing like, you're all going bald at the same time. Like there's, there's certain realities to getting older that you can't avoid. So, you know, I think that's true. And I do feel like a Gen X. And in that sense, it is part of my identity. 
I think it always kind of was, but I think it was growing up in the shadow of the baby boom was frustrating and remains frustrating, right? You know, I think we point to baby boomers for a lot of problems. It, my generation does. And at some point, you know, we're old enough that we can just sort of solve it on our own, but I'm definitely a Gen X guy. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel like uh, Gen Z is like getting overshadowed by millennials? It's interesting. And to pull the layers back a bit, we have done a bit of preparation and discussion months worth, I feel like, for this podcast. So when I think about the representation of millennials as opposed to Gen Z, I'm not really sure yet. I think the internet and social media has made Gen Z's presence more felt. Mm -hmm. They want to be heard more than Gen X ever yeah. had the opportunity to. That's true. Yeah. So I think that's a big aspect. The want to be seen and the platform for it to be seen. Yeah. Um, allows Gen Z, a younger generation who, again, isn't able to write the narrative about themselves yet. So you don't hear all the good stuff about us yet. We uh, we we got our eye on you. You guys are going places. I mean, look, Gen X did the same kind of thing with like that whole punk rock ethos of like make your own mag. No one wants to write magazines. Make your own magazine, fanzines and stuff like that. I think there was a very big DIY culture. But, you know, I want to get into whether or not generations are real. Uh, and what part of them is real and what part isn't real. So one thing that's real is that they grew up in a, a collective atmosphere, right? So whatever was going on around you, it does sort of influence you, right? So graduating college into a recession, right? Uh, that's something that marks people. Uh, I think, um, you know, people often talk about like main events that happen. You know, where were you when Kennedy was shot? Where were you when the Challenger blew up? Where were you when, you know, X, Y, Z, when John Lennon was shot, things like that. And usually people can orient themselves. But something that I did do a bit of research for this as well, and and much more than the the events are the technologies available to you, that the technology really seems to define generational experiences. So for example, cell phones, knowing where you guys are at all times, where you guys are at all times, brand new idea, right? I mean, it's, I've, I've mentioned it twice now, but that idea that like they let us out the house and had no idea where we were for hours and hours on end is 100% true. There was no way of knowing where we were. Uh, I tell the story now, of I visited Taiwan in the 90s and no one had any idea where I was for three weeks. My son went and did a semester abroad in Taiwan and I was texting him from the plane. Yeah. You know, I knew I could see where he was in Taiwan in real time. It's so it, the world has changed tremendously. But things like Gabe and I were talking about Club Penguin, for those of you out there. Gabe knows what Club Penguin is because he played it. I know what Club Penguin is because I paid for it. And I played it next to my kid. Uh, Sonika, what's Club Penguin? I had no idea what Club Penguin was. I've never heard of it. Little CP, baby. Little, yeah. uh, little penguins in scuba suits. So. You know, it is. It was um, one of the first um, uh, games that was safe for children. It was like an area where you could oh. only your avatar was a penguin Got it. and you could go up and make friends with other penguins and you could buy outfits like scuba suits and oh, wow. weird stuff. Yeah. And you played games. It was fun, though. And the important part about being, it being safe for children was that there was very limited means of communication with each other. So there's a few emotes, like a heart and a smiley face, mm -hmm. and nothing really to express any anger or mm -hmm. sadness or things that children shouldn't see. Yeah. Right, exactly. And none of the like creepy stuff. So it was interesting, but you don't know what it is. I bought my uh, one of my sons a Club Penguin t-shirt for his birthday last year. He wears it everywhere, like, nice. and all of his peers are like, yes, right? So that I think there's shared cultural references. I think, you know, something that seemed very, it, it's weird to me that like what I thought of as grunge music is now playing in the supermarket when I go shopping. Now I can really identify with people who go like, why are they playing, you know, my, the music of my youth in shop, right? So what's real is that certain attitudes are, and beliefs are shared, but for example, any generation that contains both Abby Hoffman, who was a giant radical, and Mitt Romney, right, who is a Mormon conservative, like, obviously, your individual experiences uh, and, and family background, and, you know, as you've mentioned before on the podcast, you're the child of immigrants, you know, you grew up in a very different situation than I did in terms of, like, where we lived and how we lived, and, and those things matter, but then there's this sort of generational idea that, 
uh, you're both experiencing things and you have the technology at hand, but also then you're going through life stages together. So there's this famous line gets attributed to everybody, Winston Churchill all the time. It's not really clear who said it first, but the idea is that anyone who's not a socialist at 20 is heartless and anyone who is still a socialist at 40 is brainless, right? And whether or not you agree with that sentiment, that idea is that as you go through the stages of life, you naturally become more conservative, you naturally change your attitudes, things that seem so self-evident before you had kids, and then you have kids and you're like, oh, that's why people yep. have always done it that way. So my question to you is, you know, what has your generation outgrown or what do you think you'll outgrow? I know that's a tough question, right? But things that we say about generations like, oh, Gen Z is the most progressive generation we've ever had. It's like, right, they're in college. They're they're going to change. They will get married and have children and buy cars and, and have debts and jobs, and, and they will become natural naturally a little bit less progressive and maybe not just progressive, like just your beliefs about the world. Like what has changed for you even in this stage of your young life? Yeah. I mean, I think that millennials historically, um, and even when I entered the, like the workforce, you know, 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, it was that you're a millennial, like, you know, all the cool new technology, all the new trends, how to be more efficient, like, you know, just everything and mostly technology focused, but just you're on like the up and know of everything that's going on. Um, and I think that as I've aged, um, I kind of use what I've been using and I don't have that like desire to know the latest and greatest. Like I, 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 I think it's interesting to know and I maybe want to be in the know, but I'm not actually utilizing it. And especially uh -huh. now with like AI and everything, you know, I think even more so I'll have conversations with my dad, who's a boomer. And he will say like, have you tried Bard? And like, have you tried? And I'm like, no, I just use Google. Like, I'm just comfortable with that. It's good to know that these things exist, but I'm not like itching to use it. And my friend group isn't either. And I think earlier in life, like your friends were all kind of showing you certainly that's a change from what the the experts were saying about yeah. these guys right that like they're always on the cutting edge of the next technology i was like yeah. yeah they got nothing else to do with their time but you have a kid a husband a job yeah parents yeah all of a sudden like it works i'm gonna use it yeah you know? so. yeah i'm spending my free time sleeping right <laughs> exploring um but yeah and then like as far as i mean that's definitely what i have outgrown as far as like what i think i might outgrow in the future i don't know like i i think i was thinking about that question and maybe more of like the i mean millennials are very like give me a seat at the table determined you know you've learned to grow into advocating for yourself later in life, like now in my 30s, I think I'm more verbal and outspoken. I don't see that necessarily going away, but maybe taking a little bit of a backseat as I move through my career. But it's like what you were saying, Brad, I don't think it's only attributed to the fact that I'm moving to like a different stage in my life and naturally things will feel less important and won't be so much of a priority. Have you um, changed your impression of minivans? No. <laughs> and I think that is something that the car companies need to work on for millennials, like make something that's, and we talked about this, like a minivan, but it's not a minivan because I'm not going to do that. But like an SUV it's minivan. They are not going to do that. That's, yeah, I don't know. What but about you? Maybe, yeah, what about you? So I actually want to go back to a point that we were talking about a bit earlier about Gen Z, about like the desire to be seen. I think that when we were younger, because of social media, because of the internet, YouTube especially, it was very easy to be seen. And so being seen for just the reason of being seen was what we were doing. And now it's more purposeful. Now it's more meaningful. We look at social media in a different way. We're more wary of it than maybe others are because we have seen the dangers. We've experienced the mental health crisis that they can cause, and we're growing up out of that. So we still want to be seen. We still want to seat at the table, but we have a bit more nuance when it comes to this desire to be seen. Mm -hmm. Brad, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think we felt like we were incredibly progressive. I think everybody does, you know, and then you show some of the movies that we thought were like 
regular normal movies, not even like wild, crazy movies like 16 Candles. And there are literally crimes being <laughs> in that movie. And you have to like show all of these Brat Pack movies like Revenge of the Nerds can't even be shown anymore because they just aged so poorly. And mm -hmm. obviously when you're ingesting that stuff, you don't really think that like someday this is going to be cringeworthy, just like. Uh, baby, it's cold outside. You know, that was written by a husband and wife team. It was seen as charming. It was they would perform it literally at parties and it was a duet and everybody got the context within which it, it was created. So I think, you know, society is moving really, really fast. And I think um, we felt like we were breaking a lot of molds that you didn't have to do this or you didn't have to be this kind of person that there was a book written no brow about the MTV generation that we were kind of the generation that broke apart this idea that if you drink beer you bowl and if you drink wine you read the New York Times and you go to opera and stuff like that like you can be a tattooed beer drinking opera going CEO like we we sort of mixed that stuff up a little bit, but I don't think we were as nearly as progressive as we thought we were about gender and race, for example. Um, and so you d you don't really know what your blind spots are until you see them. And then you go, wow, like we really were kind of blind to that reality. So a lot of stuff has evolved for me. And I think, you know, part of getting older is you you try not to be set in your ways. And then part of being older is you've also been through it a bunch of times and you're like, yeah, you'll 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 give up on the minivan thing right yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a metaphor right but the, the whole idea that like getting a minivan and moving to the suburbs is giving up at some point you realize that's a stance of somebody who has no reason to move to the suburbs and all they want to do is go out all you want to do is sleep now and, and read books to your daughter and that's a totally natural change in, in terms so so yes i have changed in a number of ways but um you know i th there's this one expression um uh, in here about technology, um, uh, the boomer wants to see you face to face. The Gen Xer wants to email you. The millennial wants to text you, and the Gen Z wants to send you a TikTok video. I think that's true for like this moment. But I have a standing bet with my son, my middle guy, that um, when he was like 17, he was like, "No one's ever going to use email. My generation is going to want text things." And I said to him, "I'll make you a bet, a $50 bet, that you will never text somebody a business plan." Like that there are things that are long form that for work, you actually need to use email. He was adamant he'd never need it. Well, now he's 21 and he's in college and he uses email all the time. And I point out to him, like, you were wrong five years later. Forget 50 years later. You were wrong five years later. So perspective is king on that yeah. stuff, I think, really. And 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 it's fine. I mean, again, going back to that idea, like you need people who are idealistic and, and energetic and focused on the world. And then. You need people who are focused on their families and there's sort of a natural. The, the thing that I think I find myself shocked by is you sound like your parents because you become your parents because you're actually the age of your parents when they say it. So like this whole idea that like, oh, everything comes in its time. I feel like my dad. But the fact of the matter is he was right and his dad before him was right. And, you know, if you if we're lucky enough to live that long, things things change you, you know, Um I think that technology is that you, you touched on it, and I think there's a lot to go into because I think technology is one of the main things that separates generations. Yeah. And and um, I want to get into that, but before we do, we briefly touched on it. I think it's important as far as like generational power. You've mentioned that you know Gen X is a silent generation. Gabe, we kind of touched on how maybe Gen Z is headed in that direction. Um, can you talk a little bit about generational power and what yeah, is that? Yeah, so so generational power is really, uh, it's both real and then it's sort of manufactured. Mm -hmm. So it's real in the sense that there were 71 or 72 million baby boomers. And that was a vast number of baby boomers. And there's very coherent analyses of, for example, car car manufacturing and car design that it it really followed the stages of life of the baby boomers, that station wagons were invented to haul children baby boomers around the suburbs that were just being invented and then muscle cars showed up so that they could you know sow their wild oats in their teenage years and they still have this thing for muscle cars some of them and then minivans showed up so they could carry their children you around mm -hmm. and then suvs showed up because they didn't carry their kids around anymore and like you didn't like minivans but wanted something like it mm -hmm. and now we're getting into these sort of cars that are designed more like runarounds although really like when i go down to florida i see a lot of golf carts you know but but basically you can look 
the world was designed for baby boomers in some ways. That's real. That's generational power. And I feel like millennials are in the same boat that a lot of stuff is being or was organized for you guys that now everybody is throwing their hands up going, where's all our workers, for example? Like, how come, you know, cafes can't get enough workers and everybody's saying that Gen Z is lazy. Gen Z is small. Mm -hmm. There just aren't as many of them. So if you're expecting a 22 year old to serve you your latte, there are literally 20, 10 to 20 million fewer of that age band of workers. So that's why the army can't meet its quotas. That's why your local cafe can't meet its quotas. I, I'm amazed that that part never gets talked about that. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, nobody wants to work. It's like you just don't have the number of workers you had. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I think generational power is very, very real. Like you would think that Gen Z would actually be at a premium because there's so few of them. But what's what happens instead is that in, in my field, I was an academic. The baby boom just hasn't retired out of academia. Mm. And so there's really no jobs for for X. And when they do, you know, I'm in my mid 50s, like it's far too late for me to get a tenure line job that I would want. There's other things that have changed, but I'm just saying it's it, it, there is a predictability to some of the stuff. Like I said, we knew Social Security was going to be in trouble. Five weeks after my generation closed, you can do the numbers and go, there's too few of them, but maybe millennials will pay for them, something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and then people start living longer. So, so that's, that's generational power. And you can see that like, as boomers live longer, their voting power changes as boomers live longer. They're a generation that's very different from previous generations. And so we've started looking at things like aging and sexuality, aging and independence, aging and, you know, dot, 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 being cool. Um, all of those things have changed because of the boomers. And so some of that is because they're big. A lot of that is because America was very wealthy at the top of the world, and they were the beneficiary as children of this massive amount of tension and design attention, right? You're not going to get that. <laughs> you're our kids. Yeah, I know. Sorry, the rest of your life, you're going to be overlooked. You will. Um, and that's just got to do with size. That's got to do with market power, voting power, voice, all of those things. So in that sense, it's very, very real. And how millennials vote will determine the next president in some ways. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's funny to say that, but it, it's just true. Mm -hmm. Like some people matter more than others in cohort. Right. So that part's real. Yeah. And I think that's where because we've talked about like oh millennials are you know they, they get a lot of attention they have a lot of power and i think that that's true and i think where there's power there's a lot of responsibility and i think for my generation what i'm don't get me wrong i love being a millennial and i think that we have a, a lot of power and it can be used in a good way but i also think comparing us to boomers i feel like boomers and maybe this is a hypothesis at this point but i think that that group was less polarized and they were doing a lot of the similar things having similar mindsets yes there were individuals within boomers as you mentioned prior previously that have very different mindsets but i feel like millennials we are so different just within our cohort so i can i can tell you how you're different in some ways demographically there's some reality to that right yeah. so the baby boom was overwhelmingly white it was still a white majority yeah. country it was overwhelmingly christian yeah. there were uh, divorce was very difficult to get for their parents um and so the baby boom was really raised in a sort of homogenized yeah. world. That said, there's a bit of nostalgia for things like the baby boom was also raised in um, Jim Crow, yeah. you know. So, it, you know, going back to the good old days when everybody got along, that was everybody who was of a certain right. race, class, yeah. you know, uh, those sorts of things. Whereas your generation is much more racially diverse, mm -hmm. much, much, much more family structure diverse. Mm -hmm religion diverse so Everything. you know what yeah. was considered a mixed marriage is just a marriage now mm -hmm. so those sorts of things you know change so again i mean i think the reality is the millennials have some very substantial differences from the boomers they're in some ways they're more like that generation from the tens and 20s you know of last century yeah. where there was such a massive wave of immigration. Mm -hmm. There's a huge number of second generation immigrants that you're one of them in, yeah. in your generation. And we've talked about this, like being Indian American is part of your identity, but really mm -hmm. you have more in common with 
other children whose parents came from outside the United States, mm -hmm. like eating the weird food at mm -hmm. school that your mom packed for you and stuff. Doesn't matter if it was, you know, weird from yeah. Ethiopia or weird from India, you didn't fit in necessarily yeah. in cohort. Yeah. You are the most diverse yeah. group, right? And you have been raised in a really interesting sort of time. You mentioned like you were exposed to social media at a time, I, I almost feel like, you know, how Marie Curie died from radiation poisoning, if you've ever seen her hands, yeah, yeah. like, I almost feel like you guys were the Marie Curie generation, like we exposed you to way too much social media, we allowed it to happen. And as parents, we were on watch and we, I think part of it was the way we were raised, like, yeah. just free range, like, here's a phone. Right. And the thing with social media is that being exposed to it as kids without those regulations, a lot of people will say for Gen Z, it's like the who am I generation, they, a lot of introspection, but it, I think a lot of it has to go back to like, when I look in the mirror, what do I see? It's like as simple as how do I identify what's going on in my mind right now? How do I see myself in this moment in time? And so I think that social media, because it's, you know, the glamorification of a lot of different aspects of people's lives or instant gratification aspect of it makes this generation look at themselves and ask, what am I doing? Why aren't I doing it fast enough? How come I'm not becoming right. a success? Yeah. So technology, I've mentioned that a few times, yep. right? That, and we are living, there's no, I mean, look, there, there's no question. We're living in a time when like technology is like changing so rapidly and, and that drives cultural change. Mm -hmm. What technologies do you think define your generations? You know, do you think you have more in common than say someone who was raised you know, pre, I was raised in a, in a, in a corded reality, like the, you know, your portable phone had like a long cord on it kind of stuff. So, yeah. uh, I, our generation sort of lived through the birth and evolution of the internet to today and all that, that came with it. But like, what technologies do you think define your generations? Yeah. I mean, I think for millennials, it would be social media. We were the first generation that was able to show like our highlight reel of like Facebook and Instagram and pictures of our lives and just these snapshots of like the best things that are happening, which we know a lot of times is not reality. Um, so I think creating that like false reality or yeah. like how you want people to think of your life, like you literally can control the narrative about your life. I think we had the power to do that initially. But Gabe, we were talking before we started recording about the fact that like when I came into social media, when I started even back in the day, started using like AIM, like Messenger, a Messenger, there was a lot of like, you know, guardrails and protections and like it was new. So we kind of were like easing into it and we didn't feel like kind of thrown to the wolves. I'm sure our parents thought we were, but like there was, it was different. And I think your generation is in a completely different space with technology. And I think it's interesting. Yeah. We were the ones that the parents should really have been worried about. Right. And that's why it's interesting when Brad brings up before when Gen X got to go outside and free reign and nobody knew where they were. It was similar for Gen Z, but they were scouring the internet, yeah. seeing who knows what. I just think about how much power somebody who's five or six years old in 2006 has if they have an email, a phone number, and perhaps access to their parents' credit card or just access to money on the internet. Yeah, that definitely yeah, created. A five or six-year-old, <laughs> that's crazy. Like, I was... 14 or 13 uh, like that's completely different it is interesting and like the fact that we call them phones not pocket supercomputers is part of the problem right yeah. so when i was 16 there was a thing called a cray supercomputer and it was delivered under armed guard and there was only a handful of them and you couldn't sell them to china it had less power than an iphone 4. so if i could ask one more thing about the internet and seeing i'm curious your opinion as a millennial does anybody in your cohort, any of your friends say, like, the internet raised me? I mean, well, I don't know about raised me, because I think we all remember, like, dial up and, like, you probably are like, what the heck is that? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think we remember, we were, I remember before the internet. So I don't think it, I think it was a part of, like, middle school and high school, but I wouldn't say it raised me. I have no, like, like memories of the internet when I was 10. Like I don't, I didn't, you know, use them. I was still like playing solitaire on the computer. So yeah, like you probably would say that. Of course. Yeah. And I don't want to discredit my parents in any way, mm -hmm. but however, <laughs> <laughs> but there are like, and I don't even want to get deeply into taboos, but if we were to just talk about like 
sex, for example. Right. The exposure to sex at such a young age. Right. And how much it appears regularly on someone's feed, even today, is a bit. That's something we talked about, that like the right. Internet exposed you guys to things that were so far above your pay grade age wise in terms of like jokes and to your point, like sex, sexual behavior, like the Internet really was driven in many ways was driven by pornography. I mean, that's same with VCR. Right. So so it, it was interesting and we didn't really know what it would do for you. And one of the things I've noticed is you guys have become sort of not prudes in any way, but sort of anti-sexualizing everything. My kids are really like, could you not like show me the meme of Ariel smoking a joint or something like, I don't need everything in my life to, to sort of be debased like that, which is interesting. I was curious what would happen. And basically you guys are like sick of it. Yeah. I mean, we've been flooded with it since around the time we could form thoughts and make memories. And so, yeah, we're over it. Like it was funny. But when we were like six and it was totally inappropriate, now it's just like, you're still making those jokes? I know. And I'm old to be making, I feel like a dinosaur. <laughs> but I, I think any generation that is exposed to a radically transformative technology, and the internet is a radically transformative technology, we're completely not equipped to know what the consequences will be. That was the same for uh, the Industrial Revolution, right? It gave us pollution and child labor and and um, slums and things like that. Like we just we're we're unprepared to know what the actual impacts of these things will be until it's passed, right? So right. you're resilient, you'll be fine. Like that's what they told us. Mm -hmm. We've touched on some stereotypes. You've touched on some taboos. What are the reputations that, yeah. that the generations have? So this is this is what we're going to land on, right? So this is the part that you're going to see a ton of going into the um, election cycle. Things like Gen X is angry. I think a lot of times you guys confuse us for boomers. If you want to make me angry, like confuse me for a boomer, oh, yeah. like please, right? Yeah, I um, and then very toxic, you know, that we're we're seen as like toxic masculinity, toxic sexuality, like a lot of that free range stuff was not benign. Um, but I think the, from the positive side, like we feel overlooked, uh, very self-sufficient and resourceful. Like, well, if you're not going to do it for us, we'll do it for ourselves, right? Why We don't expect much. Yeah. I think for millennials, I'm just going to throw it out there that like entitled avocado toast comes up a lot. Like, oh, you're broke because of avocado toast. Not that like housing prices have tripled or right. anything like that. Like it's we can't it. right because of avocado. You'd have to buy a lot of yeah. avocado toast. But anyway, um, that you're broke, that you're soft. You know, that like you can't really handle the adversities. I'm just giving you the negatives. I'm just such a reputation. <laughs> However, I think for the for the positives on millennials, it's things like you're very progressive, you're very yeah. diverse, you are not afraid of your feelings, you are very in touch with your feelings. Yeah. Like you are a group who will go, I need a mental health day, whereas mm -hmm. we'd be like, What the hell is a mental health day? Um, and I think for for Gen Z that it hasn't really coalesced yet, you're still in the shadow of millennials. I think you you've mentioned it too. Like just like we get confused for boomers, you get confused for millennials. Anyone right. who's like younger is a millennial and you're not. Um, but that you're lazy, you're gender confused, that's something that comes up a lot, and that you're very passive, you let things happen to you. It's like OK, um, but you're, again, very, very diverse and um, that you want to be heard and also that you're very DIY, yeah. that like 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 us. And that's something that I admire about your generation. Like, yeah, no one's going to do it for you. I'm going to go do it myself. So for those of you who don't know, Gabe designs games in his free time and stuff like that. Like, I think yeah. just sort of taking the bull by the horns and going, I don't see what I want in the world. I think the, the reputation is millennials will try and fix the system. That's because they believe the system is there for them. Gen X and Gen Z will go, I'm just going to fix it for myself because the system is not there for me. That's that's yeah. one of the major differences. To who we were raised by. So like I see the system worked really well for my parents. And so I'm like, well, I should, I want the same thing. And I'm following like their footsteps in a sense. So like I should get the same rewards and the same benefits. Whereas I think Gen Z, uh, you're raised by Gen Xers who maybe you're giving your kids different advice than I'm definitely calling the mechanical thing. Yeah. 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 Like, um, like God helps them who helps themselves is right. my main message to my children. Yeah. Right. But I think something that I really, I know Gen Z gets a lot of, you know, crap, but like, I really admire the like self, I think you guys are self starters and, and you, if you're not getting it through one Avenue, you go to another, right. whereas like millennials will just keep on going. And that persistency is good. Sometimes is sometimes we just hit a wall and we don't know how to like, 
and and okay. I just want to be clear, this is perception. Like my generation, the system worked. If, if you were me growing up in suburban Connecticut as a white kid, the system was fine. I'm just yeah. saying we felt like the opportunities were limited. Something that I talk about a lot is as I've been promoted throughout my career, for example, every time I get to a level, the perks of that level, baby boom pulls the ladder. Right. So we don't fly first class anymore. Mm. We never did. But mm. when I started in the industry, people did. We don't get corporate credit cards. I'm not I'm I'm not here to have a litany of complaints about my work. In fact, this place is great compared to lots of places. But when you look at what used to be expensed and what's expensed now and when it stopped, it really does feel very much like as soon as Gen X got into the areas where some of those perks existed, they evaporated. Yeah. And so in that sense, I feel like the system is a little bit against us, but not really. I mean, you'd have to be crazy to complain about being, you know, in the position that I was born into. I do think I admire about you guys, both the cohorts. I do think there's a, a gap. There is a gap between boomers and Xers on one side, millennials and Gen X on another. One thing that I admire is you guys are much more willing to like look at your overall health. Mm -hmm. You know, like this idea that like, no, 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 put it in the bank, sacrifice through your 20s and it'll get paid back. I think that social contract is broken. And I don't think you guys believe that if I give everything in my 20s, it'll come back to me in my 30s. You're, you're much more focused on what do I need for myself and my family now Yeah. as a Gen Xer, like kudos that you got that memo early. Um, you know, I think, I don't know, what do you guys think about Gen X? I mean, you know. I, I didn't even really know that you existed before I started. I guess bringing it back, like a lot of the work that we do within medical anthropology is these deep dive studies into generations. And when I started, you know, on this team, um, we started off doing um, a deep dive into boomers because it was a, a drug that was targeted for 65 plus. And we talked about like Generation Jones and then we talked about Gen X. And I was like, what? It's not just boomers and millennials. Like I honestly didn't even realize. And you kind of, you know. Took her aside and yeah, gave, yeah, her, exactly. gave her the spiel. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, like now learning about Gen X and how that is different than boomers and you guys didn't have the same opportunities necessarily. I think that you, um, the the persistence is admirable. Stranger Things, you don't you don't think of us when you. I I never watched it. All right. I, yeah, I, I know. It. I know. So, but yeah. And you, what do you think of millennials and Gen X? So when it comes to Gen X, I've actually oddly enough interacted with a lot of Gen X people over the last few weeks, and I've seen a lot of similarities where they are like a wealth of information they just advice just spills from them they don't even know like how wise they are it feels like sometimes when i'm oh, talking to them nice. and they're saying like like they're just giving like just throwing out free career advice like we're just sitting here playing this game like i'm on the train right now man like i don't know you personally but you just feel so eager or gen x feels so eager to share that's the part i admire a lot about gen x for sure yeah, Brad's always giving us advice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that might just be me. <laughs> but I think wrapping it up, I mean, again, some of you, some of the listeners might initially in the beginning of this conversation, like, what does generations have to necessarily do with, I mean, understand, like, communication, marketing, right. healthcare marketing. And again, like I said before, generational deep dive analyses is something that our team does. And it gives our brands so much insight into the way that these groups think based on experiences that they had to go through that sometimes we don't think about. We think about, okay, this drug targets, you know, 18 to 40, or this drug targets, you know, 65 plus. And so like, what are 65 plus doing, but it, it does help to have that generational lens to it provided our Yeah, plans. you pointed out to me like sex and old people is sort of taboo yeah. or was for a long time. And you pointed out to me that STDs are rampant uh, yeah, among the, yep. the, the baby boom generation more than they've ever had. And so clearly they're not interested in being portrayed as post-sex cookie baker cuddlers exactly. and stuff yeah. like that and and at the same time like gen z is a little bit more maybe conservative mm -hmm. about what they want to see or what they want to hear and so you know we deal with a ton of stuff that's taboo sex death poop all that stuff you know yeah. i think race is taboo in this country i think biracial marriages were wildly taboo for a long time mm -hmm. and, and i think not being able to have a lens on how the generations feel about those things means that we end up with just very bland imagery that nobody finds offensive, but nobody 
resonate identifies yeah with it doesn't resonate and yeah because you have to understand the priority of a certain generation to understand how a certain campaign or messaging is going to resonate with them and either feel like okay you're speaking to me or you're not you get me or you don't and right so yeah i think that if any like advice or anything that we could say as medical anthropologists would be um, do your research into a generation, do your research into sub generations within a generation, like really understanding not sub generations, but subgroups within a generation. Again, we say this all the time, but doing what it takes to really understand the human to then be able to create content that's going to actually change behavior. Yeah. What do things mean? To yeah. People, what, yeah. What do know? things mean? What do Things that I find funny, Gabe's generation is like, I'm so over it. Yeah. <laughs> Just really quick as an example, like if you're showing a commercial and campaign that is meant to be showing hopefulness and optimism and you show it like being a wedding, being the like end goal, someone who's Gen Z is not going to resonate with that. We know that this. Group, yeah. Like who is this for? There's so many that you're just like, this isn't what this generation cares about. So like, right. we need to rethink what we're showing. Right. Exactly. Like, like the vision of success is now you can catch the bouquet and get married and it's like come on man what is this like 1947 exactly so anyway so listen it's been a very uh good long discussion on generations gabe has introduced himself to the world he comes out from behind the camera he's the voice you hear at the end of every one of our episodes because i know everybody listens to the end of course they do of course they do so thanks for having us for breaking the code i'm brad davidson i'm sonika garcia and i'm gabriel allen cummings thank you thanks for having us bye Breaking the Code is a podcast by Havas Health and Youth Medical Anthropology Department. Created and produced by Brad Davidson and Sonika Garcia. Content editing done by Catherine Rossi. Post-production audio editing done by Gabriel Allen Cummings. And inspiration by all of you. Thanks for listening and your continued support. If you enjoy these episodes, we would love to hear from you. Please leave a rating and subscribe. Until next time.